The lurid legions bore down upon the great city of Cyrodiil, high atop their ramparts, perched like cardinals in cloaks of deep crimson. The imperial garrison scanned the horizon. The Old Merry advance was a golden tide that drowned the tranquil pastures of the West Weald. Their armor gleamed like Anu's ineffable incandescence in the midday sun, blinding the defenders. Some of the men turned their heads, some squinted with admirable stubbornness at the encroaching sea of moonstone. Whatever the response, every man along the ring wall felt a stab of fear in his heart. By nightfall, blood would slake the verger, corpses would feed the carrion, and an exodus of souls would pass on Kinnereth's wings to the gates of Aphirius. But the waters of the Romare would remember, for water holds all memory. On the lake's southern shore, beneath the roaring bear of Windhelm, stood a man prepared to stem the golden tide. Unlike the elves, this man needed no ostentation. He towered over his allies in steel plate armor. His already broad shoulders were made mountainous by the dense furs draped over them. The northern warrior galvanized his men with a shout so ferocious that the skies shook and the earth bones trembled. Even the steady drumming of the Old Merry March was thrown off tempo. The utterance reverberated through the distant valleys, and for a fleeting moment, Cyrodiil fell into a silence so suffocating that it choked all ambient sound. The war cry that followed must have echoed all the way to Akavir. It was a bestial howl that asserted itself into every crook and hollow, and into the weakening bladders of the Old Merry invaders. The Great War had come to the Imperial City, but could the combined might of the Empire endure the storm? It seemed like a doomed cause. Lord Narafin's Ultima army was too powerful, and the Red Guards were preoccupied in the defense of Hammerfell. But with fresh legions from Skyrim, led by the Northern Bear, all hope was not yet lost. This mountain of a man was none other than Ulfric Stormcloak, and the Skalds back home would live like lavish kings from the songs of his heroism. His foom sent the elven vanguard soaring like autumn leaves. Even his blade seemed to sing as it cleaved through metal, muscle and marrow. The rushing waters of the Nibbon held the memories of Pelennor's elven pogrom thousands of years prior. And now, Ulfric was making the heartland remember, as the soil drank the blood of countless elves. Alas, no one warrior can win a war. Despite his legendary leadership and his domination of the battlefield, Ulfric's Stormcloak was overrun, captured by the Dominion. And little did the Empire know, this turn of fate would have an immeasurable impact on the future of Tamriel, perhaps even the entire world. Ulfric Stormcloak was gagged and disarmed, unable even to request a swift execution. He became a political prisoner of the conniving Falmor, an asset that would be employed to fuel conspiracy and propagate uncertainty. The Falmor had meticulously planned not only their conquest of Greater Tamriel, but also its consolidation. Unlike certain Cyrodiilic emperors of old, whose cults of personality are the catalyst for their expansion, the political architects at the heart of the Old Merry Dominion were too prudent to risk hubris. They had the steps in place to make the other provinces yield, and brute force was not always the most expedient option. By outwitting their adversaries, the Falmor schemed to pit them against one another. And this is why the capture of Ulfric Stormcloak was one of the most significant victories in the Great War for the Dominion. Ulfric was assigned to First Emissary Ellenwyn for interrogation. What came next will remain behind closed doors. The extent of Ellenwyn's physical torture and psychological manipulation is up for speculation. But the Falmor are notorious for their ill treatment of prisoners, and it appears the interrogator succeeded in acquiring valuable intelligence from Ulfric. In a brilliantly sadistic move, Ellenwyn led Ulfric to believe that the information he'd surrendered was critical to the Old Merry Dominion's capturing of the Imperial City, when in actuality, the capital had fallen before he had yielded anything vital. The Falmor then proceeded to allow Ulfric's escape perhaps in an effort to restore their assets' confidence. After all, he would have a major role to play in destabilizing the Empire. For all of Ulfric Stormcloak's physical prowess, natural leadership, and strength of will, he is not a strategic genius. He is gifted in the art of war, and he is a rousing political figurehead, 
but much of what endears him to his followers is his fervent, yet sometimes impulsive brazenness. Ellenwyn and the Falmore had taken note of these traits, and were well aware that passion is easy to exploit. Ulfric returned to Skyrim with the weight of failure hanging heavy on his shoulders. He was eager to prove himself once more. So when he learned that the troublesome Reachfolk had capitalised on the wartime tumult to capture Markarth, Ulfric was keen to take action. The Reachfolk have historically been a thorn in the side of the Nords, more of a nuisance in Skyrim than a genuine threat. With the exception of Durkarak the Black Drake and his Longhouse dynasty, Witchman ambition seldom spread beyond the Reach. I won't go into too much detail about the nuances of the Reach folk and their motivations. That's a video for another time. But the Empire has always considered them to be a menace in Skyrim and High Rock, and Ulfric Stormcloak is not especially bigoted for being antagonistic toward them. Ulfric hails from Eastmarch, so he would have had no particular grudge against the Forsworn Savages, no more than any other Nord, Breton or Imperial. But as a man of substantial pride, who puts much stock in the virtues of strength and courage. He was undoubtedly incensed by the unscrupulous timing of the Forsworn Uprising. They hadn't won Markarth with a gallant display of might. They'd been deceitful. There was no honour in it. Perhaps this mindset was a contributing factor in how Ulfric chose to deal with the problem. Whatever the case, the Empire could spare no men for the liberation of Markarth, and Jarl Hrolfdir called upon Ulfric Stormcloak for Ulfric was back in his homeland, no longer on the front lines in Sirid. The retaking of Markarth became known as the Markarth Incident, and it's a troublesome topic. As unlike most of Tamriel's rich history, this matter is still very politically sensitive. Imperial sources are typically quite reliable, but can they be trusted when it comes to Ulfric? The text titled, The Bear of Markarth, The Crimes of Ulfric Stormcloak, immediately paints Ulfric in an unfavourable light, stating, Ulfric Stormcloak is considered a hero by many for his part in quelling the Forsworn Uprising. It is said that when the Empire abandoned Skyrim, and the natives of the Reach rebelled, undoubtedly due to the Nord's poor treatment of them, Ulfric Stormcloak and his militia was there to retake their land from the Forsworn. In all the bravado and epic yarns the Skulls compose of his exploits, you would think Ulfric to be a giant of a man, equal to that of Tiber Septim in his cunning, leadership, and decisive actions. We'll get into the morally grey strategy Ulfric employed in recapturing the city, but it strikes me as a little bit ironic to hear an Imperial scholar rebuke the Nords for wishing to maintain control of their holdings, and make examples of impudent dissidents. To reinforce the irony, the scholar even cited the ultimate example of this tenacious territorial dominance, namely Tiber Septim. The Forsworn have valid reasons for their uprising. That much is undeniable. But Ulfric serves his homeland, and at this point in time, he served his empire too, and reclaiming Markarth aligned with these allegiances. The text conveniently omits the fact that Jarl Hrolfdir pleaded for Ulfric's help. According to his successor, Jarl Igmund, When the Empire lost the Reach during the Great War, we became desperate. We promised a group of Nord militia free worship in exchange for their help retaking the Hold. Hrolfdir had promised something that was well outside of his authority to promise. You see, Ulfric had not taken part in the latter half of the Great War. He had waited for the Ravens to bring dark words from the front. Despite the Empire's valiant victory at the Battle of the Red Ring, and the reclamation of the Imperial City, the Old Merry Dominion came to the negotiating table with all the power. Among many concessions, the White Gold Concordat had officially outlawed Talos worship in all Imperial-held provinces. To the Nords, this was preposterous, and more traditional sons and daughters of Skyrim refused to permit Southron overseers to dictate their worship to them. As a brief aside, you may be wondering, why exactly do the Nords care so much about Talos worship? Isn't Talos the ascended form of Tiber Septim after all? Isn't Talos a symbol of the Empire they are growing increasingly disdainful towards? You also may have seen my video decrying Talos as a fraud, a Breton posing as an Imperial, hiding behind the supernatural power of an Atmoran Shezarim. For more detail, check out that video. But to put it simply, regardless of his true origin story, Talos is a god. The Nords staunchly believe he hails from Atmora, 
not from High Rock. But to be honest, that has little significance. Neither does the controversy surrounding the Ash King, Izmir Wolfarth. Whether or not Tiber Septim was a legitimate dragonborn, or whether he hid behind Wolfarth, it's all semantics. The ascended deity Talos, whether he has one head or two or three, became the new god of men. The Nords believe that their preeminent god Shaw is dead, and Talos, who was chosen by the Greybeards, who possessed the Storm Voice, who united Tamriel under an empire of men, was now the patron of all human undertaking to disavow the heir of Shaw's kingdom, and to do so at the demand of elves, that would not stand. Ulfric came to the aid of Markarth, and by extension, the aid of the Empire, because he was led to believe that doing so would secure Skyrim's religious freedom. So, there was only one loser in this arrangement, the Forsworn. Ulfric Stormcloak shouted down the gates of Markarth, and his militia charged in. The biased Imperial text, the Bear of Markarth, proceeds to say, what happened during that battle was war, but what happened after the battle was over is nothing short of war crimes. Every official who worked for the Forsworn was put to the sword, even after they had surrendered. Native women were tortured to give up names of Forsworn fighters who had fled the city or were in the hills of the Reach. Anyone who lived in the city, Forsworn and Nord alike, were executed if they had not fought with Ulfric and his men when they breached the gates. You are with us, or you are against Skyrim, was the message on Ulfric's lips as he ordered the deaths of shopkeepers, farmers, the elderly, and any child old enough to lift a sword that had failed in the call to fight with him. If true, this is the first damning indictment of Ulfric Stormcloak, but honestly, it doesn't sit right with me. Ulfric only offered his support to Markarth in order to secure unrestricted Talos worship. Did he really need to exert the effort of weeding out every root of Forsworn sedition? And if he did, he clearly didn't do a great job, for the Forsworn Rebellion is well and truly alive in the hills, and Madanark, the leader of this rebellion, wasn't even killed. The Imperial source continues with, So, when a grateful empire accepted Ulfric's victory and sent soldiers to re-establish the rule of law in the Reach, it was no surprise that he would demand to be allowed to worship Talos freely before the Legion could enter. With chaos running through the streets of Markarth, and the reports of deaths rising every day, the Empire had no choice but to grant Ulfric and his men their worship. We allowed them to worship Talos, in full violation of the White Gold Concordat with the Old Mary Dominion, which recognises the elven belief that Talos, as a human, cannot be one of the Divines. In jeopardising the treaty that so many sacrificed for during the Great War, the Empire was wrong. But what choice did they have, I ask you? Against the Bear of Markarth, Ulfric Stormcloak, no is not an answer. This explanation does make sense to an extent. It's quite possible that Jarl Hrolfdir promised more than he could deliver, and the Empire was forced to clean up the mess by acquiescing to Ulfric's demands, especially given the atrocities he was supposedly committing in the interim. One primary source that contradicts this version of events is Cedrak the Breton Stablehand. When asked about the Markarth incident, he says, It's the whole reason Ulfric revolted against the Empire. Well, the first reason, anyway. Force One had taken over Markarth, and Ulfric and his men drove them out. Empire promised they'd be free to worship Talos afterwards. Is it possible that the Empire had given Hrolfdir permission to promise Ulfric Talos worship, so that he would do their dirty work and reclaim their holding while they were preoccupied on the home front? Jarl Hrolfdir, who ought to have been grateful for Ulfric's assistance, actually betrayed him. Hrolfdir's son, Jarl Igman, states, We promised a group of Nord militia free worship in exchange for their help retaking the hold. Then the elves found out about it. We were forced to arrest all of them. Ulfric Stormcloak, their leader, used the whole thing as proof that the Empire had abandoned Skyrim. The rebels called it the Markarth Incident. It was the founding day for the Stormcloaks and where this war really started. Ulfric Stormcloak and his men had reclaimed Markarth from the Forsworn Barbarians. They hadn't executed every conspirator, and the bloodshed was almost certainly overstated by Imperial sources. To thank Ulfric for his service, the Imperials arrested him. To be fair to the Empire, they were in a very difficult predicament, 
they were too weak to hold on to their territories, and they were being haunted by Falmor justicias, ensuring the terms of the Concordat were being adhered to. But that does not change the almost undeniable reality that they had manipulated Ulfric to do their dirty work, before throwing him to the wolves. At this point in the tale, it's hard not to sympathise with him. Ulfric comments on his time in captivity, revealing that, My father, the great bear of Eastmarsh, died during my imprisonment after the Mark Garth incident. I, his only son, forced to deliver his eulogy via letter I had smuggled out of prison, such as the love of Titus Mead for his subjects. When finally set free, I returned to Windhelm and was greeted by a city in mourning, at one with my own grief and anger, clamoring in angry voices, calling out for justice, for war. They sat me on the throne, the throne of Isgomor, the throne of my father. I only hope I can prove worthy of that honor. Ulfric Stormcloak had reached breaking point. He could not continue serving an empire that capitulated to every elven demand that tossed its own loyal men to the dogs in order to save its own hide. The High King of Skyrim ruled from Solitude's Blue Palace, a seat conveniently placed in a nest of Imperial sympathizers. Meanwhile, Ulfric sat upon the traditional seat of Skyrim's High Kings, and from here he would wage a civil war for his homeland's sovereignty. We're fighting because we're done bleeding for an empire that won't bleed for us. Untold numbers of Nords died defending the Empire against the Dominion. And for what? Skyrim being sold to the Thalmor so the Emperor could keep his throne. We're fighting because our own Jarls, once strong, wise men, have become fearful and blind to the people suffering. We're fighting because Skyrim needs heroes, and there's no one else but us. High King Islod was dead. And though Imperial rule had turned traditional Nordic rites into little more than formalities, the Northmen still insisted upon their customs. One such custom was the Moot, in which the Jarls of each hold convened to confirm their new High King. Islod had an heir, and almost everyone at court in solitude was perfectly content to allow the succession to pass to the heir apparent. But there were a few at the Moot who would not suffer another Imperial puppet taking Skyrim's reins. Foremost among these vocal Jarls was none other than Ulfric Stormcloak, according to the court wizard Sybil Stentor. But Ulfric was at that moot, continually talking about Skyrim's independence in terms just shy of treason. Torig was formally named High King of Skyrim, and the quarrels regarding independence were put aside for the time being. Only Ulfric would not take no for an answer. When he next rode the cobbled streets of solitude and requested an audience with the High King, he did not come in peace. The lords and ladies gathered around their king, and Torig gave his guards the signal. The gates were opened for the illustrious Jarl of Windhelm. But when the doors to the palace swung open, the king realized that Ulfric had not come to talk. Words would be exchanged that day, but there would be no debate. Ulfric Stormcloak invoked ancient Nordic tradition to challenge the High King to a duel. Stentor states, by Nord custom, once the challenge was issued in court, Torik had no choice but to accept. Had he not, Ulfric would have had cause to call a new moot and a new vote for High King. And so, in the palace gardens, young Torik, arse still sore from settling onto his throne, stood before the most decorated warrior in Skyrim, a warrior that the High King had an immense amount of respect for, no less. Torig's trembling hand reached for his baldric, but before his pale fingers could be reassured by the sturdy grip of his regal blade, Ulfric's lips parted. Torig was sent sprawling. He landed on his back in the dirt, and his head cracked against a stone. The shock of the fall disoriented him, and time seemed to stand still as he recollected his wits. Strangely, he felt a pang of anxiety wash over him at the thought of his fine garments caked in muck. All the while, his eyes were fixed on the sky above. Blue as the banner of Windhelm, he thought. And then, realization struck him. He looked down, and Stormcloak stood over him. He motioned to speak then, but the tip of Ulfric's blade pierced his chest and twisted the words inside him until they leaked out of his mouth as a clumsy, incoherent rattle. In Ulfric's own words, I killed Torik to prove our wretched condition. 
How is the High King supposed to be the defender of Skyrim if he can't even defend himself? I challenged him in the traditional way, and he accepted. There were many witnesses. No murder was committed. True, he didn't stand a chance against me. But that was precisely the point. He was a puppet king of the Empire, not a High King of Skyrim. His father before him, perhaps, but not Torik. He was too privileged and too foolish. More interested in entertaining his queen than ruling his country. There hasn't been a true High King in Skyrim for generations. For too long he's been hand-picked by the Emperor, and given emphatic nods by milk-drinking Jarls addicted to Imperial coin. It's time we had a real High King, one of our own making. This is one of Ulfric's most controversial decisions, and while I've come to his defence thus far in the video, it's more difficult to do so here. Ulfric's sentiments are sound, and his frustrations have been simmering for quite some time. But the question is, did he adequately exhaust all diplomatic options before resorting to violence? If you ask Sybil Stentor, she will state, I don't think Ulfric knew how much Torg respected him for that. If Ulfric had asked Torg directly to stand up, to declare independence, Torg might have done it. Even Ulfric's legendary tongue must have been tired from talking about Skyrim's independence for so long. But, if Torig was as naive and impressionable as Ulfric insinuated, surely someone of his renown could pull the young High King's strings without driving a wedge through the centre of Skyrim. Stentor goes on to suggest that independence is not quite so easy to achieve, and she seems to believe that Ulfric has not fully considered the ramifications of the split. When asked why Torig hadn't declared independence earlier, she says, because the Dominion is a sleeping beast that Skyrim cannot slay alone. Because many Nords are part of the Imperial Army even now. Because the food and resources we get from the Empire are important to our people. Because even if we can't openly worship him, Talos the God was once Tiber Septim the Man, and this is his Empire. And Torg wasn't ready to let it fall apart. Perhaps Torg was not so green. Perhaps he was right to be cautious. Perhaps it was Ulfric who was acting foolish, blinded by the romance of restoring Skyrim to its glory days of old. Ulfric had proven his propensity for impetuous decision-making, yet, on the other hand, his actions were understandable, especially when put into context alongside all the injustices he had faced at the hands of the Falmor and the Empire. Whether you call it murder or a fair trial, High King Torig's death was not warranted, but Ulfric's grievances were warranted. Torig was the scapegoat, and Ulfric saw him as a symbol of the Empire that he could defeat in order to prove his might, and to show that he would rule with not only his words, but also with his sword. The brutality of the duel served to embolden Ulfric's followers, but also to broaden the gulf between the opposing forces. One thing was certain, peace would not come without a great deal of bloodshed. As always, the insidious Falmor continued to sow seeds of unrest in the north. Their unresponsive asset had played right into their hands. Not only was Cyrodiil weak, but Skyrim was sundered, kingless, bleeding. Ulfric Stormcloak may be vehemently opposed to the Old Merry Dominion, and his ambitions may be diametrically opposed to the ambitions of the Falmor. Yet even still, they wish to see him continue his rebellion, for the enemy of their enemy is ultimately a friend and chaos is the key to undoing two rival powers without any need for Old Merry military involvement. So, when Ulfric and a small company of his Stormcloak companions were ambushed by General Tullius, the Falmor knew they needed to intervene. The Empire had Ulfric in custody, and his execution would all but end the Civil War. Sure, it would cause some ripples of unrest, but nothing the Empire couldn't handle. However, Guess who just so happened to be present in Helgen? Why, Ulfric's former interrogator, Elenwyn, of course. How incredibly convenient. The Falmor dossier states, As long as the Civil War proceeds in its current indecisive fashion, we should remain hands off. The incident at Helgen is an example where an exception had to be made. Obviously, Ulfric's death would have dramatically increased the chance of an Imperial victory, and thus harmed our overall position in Skyrim. Note, the coincidental intervention of the dragon at Helgen is still under scrutiny, 
The obvious conclusion is that whoever is behind the dragons also has an interest in the continuation of the war, but we should not assume therefore that their goals align with our own. A Stormcloak victory is also to be avoided however, so even indirect aid to the Stormcloaks must be carefully managed. The reality is, while the Stormcloaks condemn the Empire for being puppets of the Old Mary Dominion, Ulfric is just as much of a puppet. Ulfric would not bend the knee to elven leaders so willingly, and given the opportunity, he would strike down every member of the Falmor. But the Empire would too, were they not in such a delicate position. The Imperials are not in bed with the Old Mary Dominion, but they are too debilitated to stop the Falmor from controlling them. At the end of the day, this does not excuse their betrayal of the Nords, who have long served as a major ally and asset of the Cyrodiilic Empire. Ulfric is a deeply flawed individual, he is brash and reckless, and I would argue that he is somewhat blinded by his pride, both national and personal. However, in certain circumstances, this is exactly what is needed. From an outside perspective, I think the wise move for Ulfric, in order to achieve the sovereignty of Skyrim and free worship of Talos, would have been to take whatever steps were necessary to defeat the Old Mary Dominion. A fortified and unified empire may have had a chance to thwart High Elven aggression, and then Ulfric could have worked towards his domestic goals. Yet, in saying all that, I can also see exactly why he took the steps he did. It's easy to comment from an outside perspective, but what if you were Ulfric? What if you were tortured by the Falmor? And then, after liberating an Imperial holding, you were immediately imprisoned by the Empire you had so loyally served? What if you had missed your father's funeral during your imprisonment? What if, after all that, you saw another gutless High King ascend to the throne? the spawn of nepotism, a slave to court politics. Even if you weren't Ulfric, what if you were a Nordic veteran of the Great War? Or a farmer watching your crops burn beneath the Red Dragon banner of the Heartland? And this is where I will let Ulfric speak for his cause, and for why he fights this war. I fight for the men I've held in my arms, dying on foreign soil. I fight for their wives and children whose names I heard whispered in their last breath. I fight for we few who did come home, only to find our country full of strangers wearing familiar faces. I fight for my people, impoverished to pay the debts of an empire too weak to rule them, yet brands them criminals for wanting to rule themselves. I fight so that all the fighting I've already done hasn't been for nothing. I fight because I must. Ulfric Stormcloak is no saint, but he is a hero. It is easy to perceive the Stormcloak Rebellion as a danger to the cosmopolitan ideals of the Empire, and there is no doubt that Ulfric's handling of racial tensions within his domain is suboptimal. As Jarl of Windhelm, Ulfric enacted a decree that forbade Argonians from living inside the city walls. There is also the issue of the Dunmer refugees who sought asylum in Windhelm in the aftermath of the Red Year and the subsequent Argonian invasion. The Dark Elves were relegated to the city's slums, known as the Grey Quarter, and it seems as though any efforts to assimilate the Dunmer into the city have been in vain. This is certainly the fault of both parties to some extent, but I'm not going to castigate Ulfric for his handling of racial tensions in Windhelm. Very few Tamrielic cultures have discovered a way to be cosmopolitan and inclusive. While I do believe Ulfric could do a lot more to remedy racial tensions in Windhelm, I do not believe this necessarily correlates with the ideology of the Stormcloak movement. An obviously partisan essay called Nords Arise details the sensationalized objectives of the rebellion. An excerpt reads, Do not let the lessons of history go unheeded. The Old Merry Dominion and its Falmor masters made war upon men, just as the elves made war upon Isgrimor and our people in ancient times. Shining Sarfal was burned to the ground, reduced to ruins and rubble in their treacherous assault. But Isgrimor and his sons gathered the 500 companions and made war upon the elves, casting them out of Skyrim. In the great war fought by our fathers, the elves again betrayed men by attacking us unprovoked. The Dominion and the Falmor cannot be trusted. Were the Nords to band together to eradicate all the Elves living peacefully within the province of Skyrim, then I would condemn it. But the Falmor are aggressing on Skyrim through a cunning proxy war. The Stormcloaks know the Imperials are not the true enemy. Their true enemy is the Dominion, 
The Stormcloaks proclaim strong anti-elven sentiment, and they are not nearly as subtle as their adversaries. But Ulfric and the sons and daughters of Skyrim have undoubtedly been sufficiently provoked. As the old saying goes, don't poke the bear. But the arrogant Ultima have repeatedly poked the bear of Eastmarch. They have sown their seeds of unrest, and soon they will reap the full force of the North. If you've seen my videos on why the Empire must win the Skyrim Civil War and the Falmor secret plan, then you'll know that I believe an Imperial victory would be the more favourable outcome, at least in the interest of ending the Falmor peril. But I also believe the Stormcloaks have good reason to fight for their freedom and for their right to self-determination. I'd say that the greatest chance for success against the Old Mary Dominion in a second great war would be for Skyrim and Hammerfell to reconcile their differences with the Empire. And then, when the Empire has regained some of its strength, the Emperor can officially renounce the terms of the White Gold Concordat, which were agreed to under duress. The problem is, the Nords and Redguards had good reason to doubt that the Empire had their best interests in mind. Maybe Titus Mede II could have done a better job communicating this to his vassal states. He could have revealed the ploy to temporarily appease the Dominion, while Cyrodiil convalesced. But while unity seems like the most logical approach, it is also possible that Skyrim could return to her historic heights of strength and success under Ulfric. By embracing traditions, worshipping their own gods, and fighting for their own national identity, as opposed to serving the interests of a foreign empire, Skyrim could just become more formidable than ever. Alas, until the Elder Scrolls VI, we can only speculate on what's yet to come. And there you have it guys, why Ulfric is a flawed hero. Ulfric Stormcloak is far from perfect, but he has a big heart and he fights for his people. It's not so easy to label him good or bad, that's why he's a fascinating character. And frankly, that's why I don't pick sides when it comes to factions in the Elder Scrolls. I love the nuances and the motivations of each individual party. It makes Tamriel feel real. What are your thoughts? I know this is a divisive topic, so please tell me why you agree, or why you think I'm completely wrong in the comments. Thanks so much for watching, my name is Drew, you've been watching Drew Mora, and I'll see you in the next one.